Thanks, Julius. All right, so uh, my name is Matthew Balance. A uh, little bit about me, uh, my day job, AMD. I do verification methodology development, deployment, make my team productive. Nights and weekends, I've got a bunch of other fun stuff that I work on. Um, a lot of it sort of comes from what I was interested in back in the days when I was working in the EDA company. Um, but I do a lot of work with uh, you know, hardware software co-verification. Uh, and very specifically, in the point of this talk uh, comes to this, using Python with uh, verification. Um, uh, if you're interested, I do have a blog where I write a bunch about a bunch of this stuff. The link's at the bottom. So this talk really is about bringing uh, Python and our traditional system Verilog UVM, or at least traditional in the industry sense, a little closer together. Um, so we're seeing a lot more cases where sort of pure Python test benches are, are used. Um, you know, there tends to be a lot of really good uh, you know, ecosystem around Python. Um, and uh, you know, test benches have been, you know, test bench libraries exist for connecting uh, Python to your HDL environment. A lot of these are at the signal level, and that does have a performance uh, impact, but that's not really the point of uh, this presentation. Maybe though, a little bit. Uh, but more and more we're seeing uh, libraries that have been uh, purpose developed for functional verification using Python with uh, an HDL environment. But in a lot of the industry, um, you know, people look at Python and they say, well, that's a great ecosystem. You know, I've got a lot of libraries over there, NumPy and a bunch of other stuff we can really make use of. But we've got an existing bench. It's written in System Verilog with UVM. We can't get rid of it because we've spent probably a thousand man years uh, developing all this infrastructure. Um, you know, we really just like to call out to Python occasionally when there's a cool library we'd like to make use of. Um, oh, and by the way, you know, probably call back because some of our test developers actually would kind of like uh, Python for their tests. Um, but of course, you know, we want to be able to reuse all the infrastructure we've already put so much effort into. Well, there's some things that get in the way of making this trivially simple. Obviously, kind of on the surface, Python has a dynamic type system. System Verilog has a static type system. These two don't really play nicely together, at least not you know, in the naive sense. Python and System Verilog have uh, conceptually similar but uh, completely incompatible threading systems. So if you want to make a you know, time-consuming call over to System Verilog from Python, from your coroutine, Turning that into a system Verilog thread just does not happen magically. Um, and then finally, the, the simulator APIs that we have really aren't set up for uh, object-oriented interactions. You know, they're, they're, they're fairly, uh, you know, they're, they're a functional level. They just don't play nicely with the object-oriented uh, OVM or Python world. You know, there's been some work to sort of wrap things using, you know, techniques like PyBind. Um, you know, this tends to end up with a bunch of uh, generated C++ code, which is also messy. It makes it hard to actually kind of share things uh, with a broader community uh, because they then now have to worry about this generated C code or generating it themselves on a kind of a per um, instance basis. So I've put together a new library that I'm calling PyHDL interface, IF. Um, to sort of target this uh, interoperability uh, between Python and the HDL world. Um, it's 99% pure Python. There's a little bit of C++ compiled, pre-compiled that comes with the Python library that's necessary just to kind of bootstrap things. But in general, just like um, you know, NumPy and a bunch of the, your other Python packages that have C++ hiding down there, the user doesn't have to worry about it. It gets loaded by Python. And from the user's perspective, they're in a pure Python and system Verilog or you know, Verilog world. There's sort of three levels to this library. Um, the, and all of these are useful depending on what kind of interaction that uh, you want to have with the, uh, the HDL world. We're going to focus on the, the center level, that, that object-oriented uh, cross-calling uh, for this talk. But all three of these are uh, pretty useful. Um, the roadmap for this library, and by the way, this is kind of an alpha library, just to give you a heads up now. Uh, the roadmap is to support uh, sort of all the APIs uh, support needed by all of the, uh, the simulators that we use. 
And in our open source ecosystem, there are a few of these uh, APIs that we have to worry about. All right, so let's think about a case where we want to implement a uh, reference, AP, uh, reference uh, algorithm in Python. This is dumb simple. This is uh, going to implement count ones in Python. Uh, let, but you know, generalize this, think about uh, having something a lot more complicated that you want to use a Python library for. So what do we have to do to make this uh, accessible from system Verilog? Well, we need to tag up a few things. We have our class, and we need to put a little decorator on that that says, hey, this is a Python HIF uh, API. Um, this will be used by some of the uh, shell generation infrastructure to, to pick up the fact that this is a, a class of significance. We need to tag any methods that we're going to call. And we tag these either as tasks or functions, or as imports or exports. And this is all from the perspective of the Python world. So the fact that I've tagged this as an export function means that I can call it from the system Verilog world, and it will invoke the, the Python method. Um, note that I've also tagged up the, uh, I've, an I've annotated uh, uh, concrete types for both the parameter type and the return type. Now, this is necessary because I want my system Verilog in its static type world to know what types it needs to expose. Um, if I don't type these, um, actually my system Verilog world will get past a Python object, which you can do a lot with, with a lot of API calls. So most of the time you're going to put a static type on most of these uh, parameters. All right, so once you've kind of tagged up your API that way, and annotated uh, what APIs you care about and uh, the, the types, you're going to generate a little wrapper class. And the good news is users, I've showed the code here because this is system Verilog code calling the Python API directly. This is what gets generated. It's all pure system Verilog. The user doesn't worry about this. The user has a class with a function count ones that they can call that will turn around and call the Python world do all the data conversion, and uh, end up taking an integer and returning an integer after calling my, my reference function over in Python. So in terms of how I use this, um, you know, I'm going to inst create a new instance of my uh, class over in System Verilog. This creates a copy, a, a peer object over in Python. So these, the System Verilog object and the Python object are linked. So when I call my count ones on my system Verilog class, the Python method gets called, all the data goes back and forth, and I get the, uh, the, the, the value returned from my Python um, function. Now, by the way, I, I won't go into the details, but you don't always have to create the object from system Verilog. You can create a system Verilog class that wraps an existing Python object. So you, you have the freedom to go either uh, direction in terms of you know, which site is, is kind of the initiating uh, um, object. But let's think, you know, let's uh, kind of go the next level of uh, complexity. So what if we wanted to, um, you know, actually implement a, our, our UVM sequence in Python? So it, this is kind of a standard model. You have your UVM sequence. It has some built-in methods like, you know, read and write. Um, and then every UVM sequence that uh, people write uh, inherit from this base sequence, and they specialize the body task to use those, uh, those existing uh, base methods to carry out the test. Um, so here, things are a little bit different. We, have, we still have our, our Python class. We've tagged the, the body method. Notice that this is an export task and it's an async method like you would expect in Python or uh, CocoaDB for a, a time-consuming method. Um, and so what this means is that we can call that as a task from System Verilog, and it will sit there and consume time as it needs, you know, as, it, as uh, required. We've tagged up the read and write methods um, as import tasks. This means we can call them from Python, and they will c consume time in the simulator. They'll end up in task calls on the uh, system Verilog side. 
And so we can write our little uh, test where we go through and uh, you know, do a bunch of writes and then do a bunch of readback. You know, I haven't illustrated all the you know, checking logic you might do there, but you can imagine you know, simple uh, read-write test. Um, so we can give this, ta uh, this, this class uh, to our test writers. They can inherit from that in Python and write whatever tests they want using the uh, system Verilog API that our uh, UVM test bench exposes. Now, this is where <laughs> there's a little bit of special uh, sauce in the, uh, in the library. Um, there is specific code both on the Python side and the system Verilog side to synchronize the notions of async uh, threads on the uh, uh, Python side with um, system Verilog threads on the system Verilog side and to manage the fact that if you, when you call a task on the system Verilog side, it's implemented on the Python side, you need to start up a coroutine for that to run. Uh, when it calls back, you need to synchronize and start threads on the system Verilog side. Um, and this actually is set up such that if you're running a library like CocoTB, it, it, it detects that and uses the, the library's uh, async you know, thread creation uh, facilities. If you're not, it uses the, uh, the built-in async I.O. Uh, facilities from Python. Um, but basically, from a user perspective, this is pretty much transparent. You know, you call a, a task on the system Verilog side, your uh, time-consuming method, your async uh, method on the Python side gets uh, called, and you just write, um, you know, functions like you would uh, expect. So that's pretty much it uh, in terms of, that's kind of the high level of the, of the library. Uh, it's designed really to allow you to easily bring Python into your existing, you know, system parallel UVM bench. Uh, some of the other aspects of the language are really set up more for, let's say, the procedural interface are set up for people that want to, let's say, build a system Verilog friendly wrapper around a library like NumPy. Um, and the TLM interface is really set up for people that are uh, writing bus functional models and they need a, a, a specialized pipe to uh, control those. Um, so the project is available. Um, it currently focuses on getting that, that cross-call, um, the, the object cross-call, uh, um, that's functional. There are examples you can take a look at. There's a roadmap of features. Um, follow the project, follow the blog for uh, updates. Um, so I guess I'll take questions. If there are any. Uh, my first question is, uh, so th this, you could use this in combination with CocoTB. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. All right. So you basically, in a, I mentioned there were some performance downsides to the signal-based interface of CocoTB. This gets you the best of both worlds. Fast access to BFMs, sideband signals, keep using the, the direct uh, access. Take your choice. We can hear you. <laughs> Just go for it and I'll, I'll repeat it. Yeah, I, I, uh, my question would be kind of like, what do you consider the roadmap or, and you mentioned C types or, or what can be used. Right. I, I guess my biggest problem generally when I'm in Python or, all right, starting over, my, my biggest issue is getting from Python to Verilog and back and forth is I never want a native C type, I want a struct and it's full of stuff. Like, do you consider a roadmap of how to like transport those back and forth kind of on top of like DPI or whatever? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Right now you could do that with the, the API base. Um, so you could call, you know, you could use accessor methods to get access to your data. Um, the, the TLM layer is all about structs, passing <laughs> structs back and forth. And certainly I could see that, you know, kind of enhancing the, the call interface to support passing structs back and forth as well. Absolutely. So it's been a few years since I've hacked on CocoTB, but would it be worth, like, putting this into CocoTB as well? Good question. Um, at minimum, it's complementary, and it, it 
you know, adds on quite nicely. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you either add it in or simply look at it as a layer that gets added on top. But um, that's more of an architectural kind of a project scoping question more so than. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know that there's a technical advantage, let's say, to putting them together. I'm just wondering about, you know, use. Like if you kind of put it into a, I'm not saying this isn't very widely known, but Cocoa TV is very widely known, right? Right, right, right. right. So you could, but yeah. you can, can you do like Python, like sub modules kind of thing? Or you could. There, there's a bunch of ways, you know, you can think about it as a kind of a, a PR task, you know, uh, making people aware of, yeah. think of it from a technical level, um, but yeah, there, there are lots of ways to deal with making sure that people know about this other than simply, you know, yeah. combining the code bases. I think jumping out to Python would be valuable, because a, a lot of the time we do stuff in like C, we've got people running C models of things, but it'd probably be quicker to do Python, right, most of the time. This is any other questions for Matthew? All right. Yeah. I guess not. I guess that's it. Well, but thank you very much. That's super. I can't wait to see what you come up with.